Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, We hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. The Book of Acts is a summary of the first time the first church did things for the very first, first time in terms of breaking down barriers that had once existed culturally, religiously, and politically. And so story after story in the book of Acts is God using his people to really push through, to bring people together, and to bring the world into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So a few weeks ago, we started with this concept of a radical inclusion of the nations, radical inclusion of the nations. Then we saw a radical inclusion of the poor, not just people that have giving charitably to the have-nots, but a real elevating of all people and treating them as equals. Last week, we talked about a a first radical inclusion of the sexual minority in Acts chapter 8, as God really says, hey, I know this is uncomfortable for you religious types, but get to know this Ethiopian eunuch, spend time with them, and, and introduce them to the grace of God through Jesus Christ, and this great celebration of faith came as a result. And today we're going to talk about the first radical inclusion of our enemy. The first radical inclusion of our enemy. Now, as I mentioned that concept, that we are today going to talk about a radical inclusion of our enemy as we see the story in Acts chapter 10, some of you might get a little nervous because you have an enemy and you know that enemy. Somebody perhaps who has hurt you deeply, someone who has betrayed you, someone who has taken advantage of you, perhaps someone you so fiercely disagree with that you can barely speak to them, perhaps a family member that you've had some big just blow up with and you haven't talked to them perhaps in months or years, perhaps a whole category of people you might consider to be an enemy. So if you are a conservative, you might think of progressives in a certain way. If you're a progressive, you might think of conservatives in a certain way. You might be very uncomfortable with a certain ethnic group for whatever reason. Uh, maybe lifestyle choices. You're very uncomfortable in certain environments with certain people. You might just want to take a little time right now before we get into Acts chapter 10 and take a little stock of who that enemy is, either a person or a group of people. Who are you most uncomfortable with? And as we go through Acts chapter 10, just think of yourself. Imagine how this person that might be an enemy of yours, how you can begin to build a bridge. And I'm not talking about, you know, avoiding um, boundaries that you have to put on your, on your life to, to sort of protect yourself. I get all that. That's all good. But I'm talking about a, a breach of relationship with somebody who now kind of stands as an enemy of yours or a group of people you're most uncomfortable with. How can you build bridges? And we're going to see how that takes place here in Acts chapter 10. Now, some of you might think, well, I don't have any enemies. There's nobody that comes to mind in terms of someone who I am opposed to or is fiercely opposed to me. But what I want to do is think more broadly than an individual and think about groups of people that the culture says should not get along, because that's really the context of Acts chapter 10. We're going to see in Acts 10, Peter and Cornelius. Peter is a devout religious Hebrew fisherman. Cornelius is an elite Roman oppressor military commander. Gentile, pagan. These two should not know each other. These two shouldn't see each other. These two would never have crossed paths. These two, culturally speaking, were enemies. The culture said these two should not get along. They should not get along. The culture said the Jews should be enemies of the Romans. The Romans should be enemies of the Jews. Worshippers of the one God in the Old Testament should never be friends with people who are pagans, worshiping many gods in uh, temples with idols. The underprivileged should be enemies of the privileged, and the privileged should be enemies of the underprivileged. We see Peter and Cornelius. They don't have anything in common. The culture tells them they should be opposed to each other. They should be enemies. But here in Acts chapter 10, we see that enemies were brought together as friends by God's grace through Jesus Christ. Enemies are brought together as friends by God's grace through Jesus Christ. Peter, a common, religiously devout Hebrew, became friends with Cornelius, an elite Gentile pagan Roman military commander. And even at that concept that Peter could possibly somehow build any kind of friendship with Cornelius, here was Peter's very first reaction to this notion. He was very perplexed. Peter was very perplexed. He was totally confused. 
even at the idea that he could be friends somehow, some way with Cornelius, it was perplexing. Now, we look at this story and we might think, okay, well, I understand that. This is sort of uh, ancient civilization. This is ancient Hebrew culture. And, and here's this Roman culture. And yes, we understand that they should not get along. Rome invaded the, um, the land of the Hebrews. And so there was tensions militarily. There was tensions culturally. There were ancient religious tensions. We get that. But I want to be very, very clear. Those same political, religious, cultural, ethnic tensions that caused Peter and Cornelius to perceive each other as enemies are the same tensions that exist today. 2,000 years later, the very same tensions. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are cultural forces, very strong, very loud, very powerful cultural forces that are imposing the narrative that impoverished inner city black and brown people should be enemies with the police. Now, there, there is a complex history there. There are, are, are instances of abuses and injustices for sure. But political forces, even religious forces, insert this narrative and impose this narrative that they are to be enemies. Inner city black and brown people should be enemies with the police. Police should consider them to be enemies of, of the police. It's a cultural imposition. And to broaden this a little bit, cultural forces also impose the narrative that white people and minority communities are enemies in some respects. The culture is pushing this narrative. And yes, there are absolutely very serious instances where there is racism and there is abuse and there is oppression. There are systemic issues. We've talked about that a lot here. But the culture fuels that. The culture pours you know, gas on that fire and insists that the majority community and the minority communities should consider each other to be enemies. There are strong and powerful cultural forces today that impose the narrative that the underprivileged are enemies of the millionaires and billionaires. In fact, you've probably heard this a lot and read this a lot on news posts and social media, cable news, that the millionaires and billionaires, that they're kind of the enemy of the underprivileged. They got where they were either because they inherited it or because they oppressed people along the way. So they're the enemies, the one percenters, right? And the one percenters are, are, in, are sort of looking down on the underprivileged and maybe accusing them of, of being uh, lazy or entitled. There's all these things that go back and forth, and the culture pours gas on that fire. There's cultural forces that are imposing the narrative that progressives are enemies of conservatives, and conservatives are enemies of progressive. And there's just this lazy political dialogue that goes on. And some of you are, are in you know, various positions and maybe have various opinions or have liked or shared certain things on social media, and perhaps you get blasted. If you shared some conservative things, you're being blasted by the progressives. If you shared some progressive things, you're getting blasted by conservatives. I have the honor of, of being blasted by conservatives as being uh, progressive and blasted by progressives as being conservative. It's just part of the fun of being alive in 2020, 2021. It's just the way it goes. And culture itself, the powerful forces of culture are imposing the narrative that yes, keep these camps divided. Keep them considering each other the enemy. Keep them you know, volleying accusations and believing the worst and calling each other names. Keep it going because if we can keep that going, we're gonna profit. We're gonna get the views. We're gonna get the ad sales. We're gonna get the likes. We're gonna get the notoriety. We're gonna sell books. We're going to have a, you know, a popular TV show. What are these cultural forces that exist today that are insisting we remain enemies of one another? It's the same three, and I talk about these three all the time. I ain't going to stop talking about these three. It's political parties. Political parties are a nightmare. Political parties run on peddling fear and making enemies. It's what happens. I mean, listen to every political speech, watch every political ad, every single one does the same thing. They peddle fear and they encourage making enemies every single time, every single time. Political parties are a nightmare. Equally nightmarish is the news media that attach themselves to political parties. So if you go right through the, the channels of cable news, each one of them, every single one of them is tied to a political party. They're the propaganda machine of a political party. It's one and the same, and they do the same thing every time. They peddle fear and make enemies. That's how they get their views. That's how they get their likes. That's how they sell ads. Religion is the same thing. Religion runs on peddling fear and making enemies. You look at 
pretty much every single religious institution and the same thing happens. You peddle fear, the fear of the world, the fear of the immoral, the fear of you know, improper doctrines, right? And making enemies. It's us versus them. It's God versus them. And we've got to you know, rally you know, around God and we have to defend the truth of his word. We have to defend you know, biblical morality. We have to defend you know, the, that we are the righteous. We are the right, we are the moral, we are the pure and they are not. It's the same thing, whether it's politics, news media, or religion. These are strong, powerful, influential forces that peddle fear and make enemies. The exact same forces that were at play in the time of Christ, the exact same forces that were in play during the book of Acts as the early church was being built are the exact same forces that are at play right here, right now in our own time. And, and so many of us, not intentionally, but we're sort of led astray. We, we lean a certain direction and we consume that kind of media and it just takes us down this rabbit trail of peddling fear and making enemies. The same was true 2,000 years ago. Cultural forces demanded that Cornelius and Peter were enemies. Every single political and religious force at the time told Peter that Cornelius was his enemy, told Cornelius that Peter was his enemy, every single one. And they believed it. They believed it. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was a high official in the Roman army. And so he had absolutely every right and privilege, not only of a Roman citizen, but of the wealth that comes from being a commander in the army. And he had the uniform, he had the power, he had the money, he had the Roman eagle, he had it all. He had it all. And then Peter was a common Hebrew fisherman, devoutly religious, a quiet, humble man. He was leading an early church movement, a small Hebrew-only early church movement. The culture said you have to be enemies. The culture says you wouldn't cross paths. The culture said you could certainly not be in each other's homes. You would certainly not make friends, but that's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 10. These two could not be more different. In fact, uh, politically, there was this kind of weird alliance between Rome, this invading empire, and the Hebrew people. Rome said basically, hey, Hebrews, don't bother us and we'll let you worship your God. Just don't bother us. No insurrections, no uprisings, no guerrilla warfare, nothing. Just don't bother us and we'll let you worship your God. Deal? And for the most part, over several hundred years, that deal sort of stood. They didn't like each other, but they tolerated each other for the sake of mutual peace. But Romans looked at the Jews and they thought, these people are strange. They refuse to eat pork, which is about the strangest thing, I agree, could ever happen on the face of the earth. Why would someone not eat bacon? How could you not eat? eat bacon. How could you not enjoy a cheeseburger? You can't eat shrimp. You can't, you know, uh, eat a, a steak medium rare. You have to w cook it well done. I mean, that's the greatest sin of all. How could this be? So Rome looked at, at the Jewish people who couldn't eat all this good stuff or the stuff they could eat, they ate in the most, you know, gross way possible. So the Romans are looking at these, at these people thinking, what are you doing? And, and the Hebrew people were saying, well, listen, we're just obeying the Old Testament where, you know, back then it was the Old Testament, but it was God's law. That's what God told them to do, and so they did it. And Peter was equally disgusted by the Romans, that they ate everything. I mean, they were gluttonous. They were Epicurean, right? Hedonists. They just consumed it all. They ate everything. They bought everything. They did everything sexually imaginable. There were har hardly any boundaries on them. So the Jews, the religious devout Jews, were looking at the Romans going, you guys are disgusting. Romans are looking at the Jews, you're disgusting. Romans wondered why Jews circumcised their infant boys. Now, from a Roman perspective, you might look at, well, you're, you're doing that to your infants. Why would you do that? And the Jews are saying, well, again, we're pointing to our religious law, our Jewish religious law, and it says to do that as a sign that we're separated. And they just didn't get each other, and you can understand why. They couldn't understand that there was no image of God in their temple. Rome had tons of temples, hundreds and hundreds of temples. They worshiped upwards of a thousand gods in their pantheon of gods. You go into a Roman temple, get past the courtyard, go through the columns, you get to a statue of something. There's something in that temple that you can worship and honor, right? You go to the Hebrew temple built by Herod. It's the third building of the temple. You go into this amazingly ornate temple, outer courtyards, inner courtyards, basins, the holy place and the holy of holies. And you get to that holy of holies, which is about the size of this stage here. And you open up the six inch wide, thick curtain to reveal the Hebrew God, and there ain't nothing there. Nothing there. 
The whole temple is built to unveil a curtain where there's nothing there. And the Romans are thinking, why do you go through the trouble of building all this temple and there's nothing in that temple? And the Hebrews say, well, our God is invisible. And if there was anything that we made, that would be idolatry. And the Romans are just like, I don't get you at all. And then the Jews looked at the Romans and said, you are worshiping thousands of gods. You just, in the middle of the night, you make up a new God a day and you build something and call it a deity. They didn't get each other. Romans thought the Sabbath day of rest, you know, that Saturday of rest commanded in the Old Testament. Romans thought that was just lazy. You are just chilling out, you know, relaxing every single Saturday. And we're here working, you know, kind of defending your, your nation for you. You're welcome. And the Jews just thought, well, that's our day of devotion, right? And so Roman, you're not devoted to anything but yourself. They just didn't get each other. Gentiles ate all kinds of unclean food. They touched all kinds of unclean things according to the Old Testament law. And so the Jews considered the Romans to be unclean, unclean human beings, not just unclean in their actions, but unclean human beings. And then, of course, to just add to that whole story, there were constant little skirmishes between Jews and Romans. There were little insurrections that Rome would just crush with crucifixion of thousands of Jews. It was complicated, to say the least. So that's a little backdrop of why Peter and Cornelius would really never know each other. Harsh treatment, oppressions, taxation. I mean, the Romans' relationship with the Jews was tough. So needless to say... Peter and Cornelius couldn't be more different with political and religious forces solidifying the narrative that they were enemies. They were enemies, but God had other plans, didn't he? Every story in the book of Acts is God breaking down social norms, breaking down political norms, breaking down religious norms and bringing people together and bringing everyone together with God. So here's how it goes in Acts chapter 10, verse three. One afternoon, Cornelius had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. The angel of God says to this Roman centurion, send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. Now, if you were here last week, as we talked about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, you're going to see some parallels between Acts 8 and Acts 10. You're going to see first an angel of the Lord demand something very unusual that two people who would never see each other meet. After the angel does his job, you're going to see the Holy Spirit move to bring these two people together. And then you're going to see a soldier do his part to bring two people together by force. Because what God is doing here is something that would never have been done culturally. So God is pushing this forward literally by force. Angel, Holy Spirit, and a guard with a spear forcing two people together that would never be together for any reason. Because they were enemies. Now the question needs to be asked here. If, if an angel is showing up to Cornelius towards the goal of bringing Cornelius to faith in Jesus, why doesn't the angel just share the whole message? Why does the angel say to Cornelius, go get Peter? God doesn't need Peter in the mix to share the message of Jesus. If an angel is talking, just finish the story. No big deal. Get it done. Very efficient. But why does God tell Cornelius, go get Peter and you two talk? I think it's because God wants something more than people just knowing Jesus. God wants something more than people just having a personal relationship with God through Jesus. God wants there to be total global unity in relationship with each other. So God says, Cornelius, I'm not gonna just give you the message of Jesus for you to receive and be baptized so that you can enjoy a personal relationship with God. I'm gonna force this situation where you're gonna get to know someone you would never know in your entire life And through your relationship, you are going to get to know what I want in our relationship together. God uses us. He uses us not to just talk about Jesus, but he uses our relationships and, and bridge building in order to express just how much God cares for us. To put it this way, maybe salvation isn't just about bringing people to God through Jesus Christ, but bringing people together in Jesus Christ. That was good. You should have all gone, ooh, that was really good. Take notes if you're not started. Maybe salvation isn't about bringing people to God through Jesus Christ, but bringing people together in Jesus Christ. Well, thank you. 
We talk about salvation a lot in Christian circles. And, and typically when we talk about salvation, and it's totally understandable, is people need to know the love of God through Jesus and the forgiveness of God through Jesus. So let's talk about Jesus. Let's receive Jesus. Maybe be baptized as a sign of his love and cleansing grace over our lives and the new life that we're raised in. That's all great. That's a personal relationship with Jesus. It's all great. But God wants so much more than that. He doesn't want us to just have a personal relationship with him. He wants us to know each other. He wants us to cross all of these boundaries that culture puts between human beings, between ethnicities, between rich and poor, between sick and well, between saint and sinner, all of these barriers that we put in front of each other. God's saving work means they all come down, every single one, and it is not easy. It is not easy, but that's what's happening right here. God's saving grace is not just about bringing us into a relationship with God, but about us experiencing relationship with each other, all of us, everywhere, without barriers getting to know each other, loving each other. So this is a complex thing for Peter because all Peter knows is that God blesses Hebrew people. All Peter knows is that God gave the Hebrews this religious law. And if the Hebrews keep the religious law, God will keep blessing the Hebrews. Peter was all about the Hebrews, his tribe, his bloodline, his Hebrew law, his religious obedience, his religious devotion. That's all he looked at. And so for the angel and the Holy Spirit to really push that through, God had to sort of till Peter's heart a little bit, had to get Peter ready. So here's how that goes in Acts 10.10. 10. While a meal was being prepared, Peter fell into a trance. This is a pre-dinner um, you know, slumber. And during that trance, he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down from heaven. So God's basically saying, here's a, here's a tablecloth filled with things for you to enjoy. And on that tablecloth were all kinds of animals, reptiles and birds. Now, this is unclean food. According to the Old Testament, this is unclean food. And the Lord says, get up, Peter, kill and eat it. Eat unclean food. Eat the very thing that you think is disgusting and sinful. Eat the very thing that you label others as unclean because they eat it, right? No, Lord, Peter declared. He says, I'm not going to do it. Peter says that a lot. He said that a lot to Jesus. He's like, no, Jesus, and it doesn't go well for Pete. No, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. Peter says, I'm following your commands. I'm following your law. I'm following the first five books of the Bible. The law of Moses. God, you gave, I'm just following that. And now you're telling me to break that law? And God says, yeah, uh-huh, I actually am. Now this might freak us out. Because if we don't have a, an understanding of how to read the Old Testament law, this is going to freak us out. How can God give a law and then tell Peter to break that law? It's really simple. And I'm telling you, if we understood this concept, the Bible just would be perfectly clear to us. Mostly. <laughs> It'd be easier, let's put it that way. In fact, uh, a good friend of mine said, hey, I want to read the Bible for the first time in, in my life. I want to read the Bible. I said, please don't start from the beginning and, and go. It's going to be, you'll never recover. <laughs> start with Jesus and then read that way. Start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because you understand the fullness of God through Jesus. Then you can read the Old Testament and New Testament properly. Here's how to read the Old Testament. The Old Testament was a government particularly the first five books of the Bible, was a government given to the Hebrews while they were wandering in the wilderness with no land and no governing authority. God just gave them a government. First five books of the Bible. Here's the laws, here's the do's and the don'ts. Don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, the commandments. Here's some consequences if you, if you break the law. It was to civilize this uncivilized people wandering in the wilderness, no government, no land. That's the Old Testament, first five books of the Bible. That's how to read your Bible. First five books of the Bible are not the law on us today. They're not. Jesus was clear about that. Especially the book of Galatians is clear about that. The New Testament is very clear. The book of the law, the first five books of the Bible, all these commandments about dietary laws and Sabbath laws and all that given to be a, a handmade government to a wandering tribal people for that day and that age. That's how to read the Bible. Isn't that remarkably freeing? Because people, all, all Christians, everybody who reads the Bible are like, ah, that seems like that's the, the God is very different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. 
Jesus is very unlike what I'm seeing in the Old Testament. And so we get our heads kind of in a nod because we want this grand unified deal. And just understand the Old Testament is what God gave to the Hebrew people for that time and that place. It is not our governing authority today. Jesus made that very, very clear. I speak about that a lot and get in a ton of trouble over it. That's why God can say, Peter, yes, I gave this law to the Jews for that time and that place. But I'm telling you right now, what I told them was unclean is clean. It's not a contradiction. It's a different time and a different place. And there's different rules. And the rule that's in place right now that Jesus made very clear, all the law, all the prophets, all the commands of God, everything can be summed up in one word, and that word is what? Love. That's the law that rules them all. So the voice speaks again. Don't call something unclean if God has made it clean. Peter wakes up from his slumber and he is totally confused. Hebrew man, following the Hebrew law, was just told by the God who gave him that law, what I said was unclean before is not unclean now. Peter was totally confused and kind of grossed out because God was basically saying, Peter, you can eat that bacon pork sandwich. You can eat that cheeseburger. You can have your steak medium rare. You can eat that shrimp. And Peter's like, oh, I can't even imagine touching that gross stuff, right? To us, it's just ooh, delectable. To him, it was just gross. He could never imagine having that stuff touch his lips. Hundreds and hundreds of years, his people have never touched that stuff. And God says, eat, go for it. Peter says, that's disgusting. Now, the, the closest parallel I can, I can give to that is um, uh, eating grub worms. I was in the Amazon with the tribal people, and they pulled up this uh, kind of rotting stump and all these fat grub worms. We're talking about two or three inches fatties. And just, mm, 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 here, oh, <laughs> I went, I mean, to bite in to a three inch grub worm and that rubbery skin and it just pops this white goo. Just, <laughs> That's what Peter was thinking and feeling at the thought of eating this unclean food, but it was worse than that. I just, I, I just retasted that. It's disgusting. It was worse. To, to Peter, it was sinful. You eat that stuff, you're breaking the law of God. It is sinful. I mean, Leviticus 11, right out of God's word, the, the pig is evenly split hooves. I mean, I'm sure when you are about to, you know, make your dinner, where's the evenly split hooves? I can't have any of that, right? This is Old Testament law. It's commandment doesn't chew its cud, so it's unclean. You may not eat the meat of these animals or even touch their carcasses. They're unclean. So in Peter's mind, everyone that ate that food was in themselves unclean, including this Roman centurion. So meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over this very confusing vision, why would God say something is clean that he already said was unclean? The Holy Spirit, here's the Spirit now, moves and says, "Uh, three men are coming for you. Get up, go downstairs, go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. Same as Acts 8. Angel, then the Holy Spirit moves in because this has to be forced, and then a guard with a spear moves in. Cornelius' guard says, hey, Peter, we're going to Cornelius' house. Yay, and off we go, right? God's grace brings enemies together. That's the point of Acts chapter 10. God's grace brings enemies together. And so Peter goes to Cornelius' house and makes it very clear, I don't want to be here. Peter told them, you know, it's against our law for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile's home like this or to even associate with you. Just so we're clear, I'm a Jew. I think you're unclean. This house is unclean. It is against the Hebrew law for me to cross the threshold of this door, just so you know. But God has shown me I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. The vision was not about food and not about animals. The vision was about people. And so when God said in the vision, do not declare unclean, what I've declared clean, clean, God was saying to Peter, do not declare people unclean that I have cleansed by my grace. So you're going to walk in that house and you're going to get to know Cornelius and his family. Peter says, I came without objection. I'm here. I'm here. Peter was taught that this small remnant was actually blessed of God. The small Jewish tribe with this Jewish blood flowing through their veins, this small group of faithful adherence to the old covenant law, this small group of religious people 
that believed the right things, did the right things, and lived moral lives. That small little group were blessed, and God is knocking that whole thing down, knocking that whole paradigm down, tearing down every wall of politics and race and religion and saying, listen, I am equally blessing everyone, not just the remnant, but the entire world. And Peter, you better get on board with this. Go into that house and, and tell the first, Jewish, uh, the first non-Jewish family about the Savior, Jesus Christ. They are ready, they are ripe. Bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Let them, with great pleasure, receive the unconditional love of God through Jesus Christ. Let them have the gift of unconditional love. Let them have it. It's not just about the remnant, Pete. It's about the whole world. Now go, go. And Peter says, God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. What if people who, who follow Jesus, they're Christians, they, they claim the name of Christ as their faith. What if every single one of us did what Peter did right here and simply say, God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. I look at everyone in the world as pure and clean by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That when God gave Jesus, he gave Jesus for all when God showed his love, he showed his love to all through Jesus. When God showed his forgiveness through the cross of Jesus, he showed that to all. And now the world just needs to hear about it. They need to hear about it. And not just hear about it from an angel or hear about it from a distance, but to hear about it in a relationship because we who claim to follow Christ should keep doing what Jesus did. He broke down the barriers personally, relationally. He treated the sick and the well the same. He treated the sinner and the devout the same. He treated the rich and the poor the same. He treated women and men the same. He treated Jew and Gentile the same. He treated every political party the same. In his time, that was the Zealots, the Publicans, the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Levite, the Herodians, the Galileans, who were all political enemies. He treated them the same. And we should as well. God's unifying grace is displayed through Jesus Christ. So that's what our lives should be about, displaying the unifying grace of Jesus to everyone, everywhere. Acts 10, 39, it is all about Jesus. We have witnessed all that he did throughout the land. We've witnessed this Jesus, loving everyone, everywhere. Yet they put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. God is God of love, and he showed his love through Jesus, and his love was so offensive to these power brokers, these culture creators that want to make enemies, they crushed him because he was a God of love and a God of unity. Everybody that fuels division and prospers on division put him to death, but they wouldn't win. God's love won, raised Jesus from the dead, and it's, it's his love that reigns right now. It's his love that rules right now if we just let it. If we just say no to the division of political parties and no to the division of race and no to the division of religion and we say, I'm looking to Jesus and I'm looking to the example of Peter and I wanna follow this program. I wanna follow this program, not forced by an angel, forced by the spirit of God or forced by the spear of a, uh, of a soldier, but I wanna willingly cross every one of these barriers and get to know people and love people and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Now, there were those who treated Jesus as an enemy, for sure. There were those who treated Jesus as an enemy, yet he treated everyone like friends. Can we do the same thing? Can we make a decision, a commitment to treat everyone like friends, even though your religious upbringing says, not them, even though your political affiliation says, not them, even though your ethnic experience says, not them? We say, you know what? God has shown me. God has shown me to treat every single human being equally, equal respect, equal dignity, equal love, equal grace, an equal measure of respect that says, I'm going to believe the best in you, not the worst in you. I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to get to know your story. I'm simply going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus loved the world as the heavenly father loved him. It was that easy. Which allowed Peter to say, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. And they were baptized. The whole family, first Gentile family to be baptized as followers of Jesus. Quite a story. But then it ends with a, a, a phrase that is often overlooked. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. 
several days they stayed in that house. Peter didn't just go in, preach the message, make a convert, notch on his Jesus belt and bail. He made a friendship in his home, in his unclean home with his unclean family. You know what happened after that? This is actually very sad. Peter goes back to his Jewish friends and he gets lit up. His Jewish friends attack Peter. Attack Peter. Acts 11, 2. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of Gentile men and ate with them? How dare you break these religious, cultural, and political boundaries? How dare you, Peter? So you can imagine Peter has all the excitement of making a new friend, all the excitement of crossing all these barriers and getting to know a story that he would never have known and getting to hear his heart and getting to know his family. And he probably has this great days long experience in Cornelius's home. And I'm just guessing here, but he's probably flying pretty high. It was a great adventure. Never experienced in his life this kind of relationship. And he walks probably back to his hometown ready to share the story of all that God has done to bring saving grace to the world, even to the Gentiles, even to the Romans. He gets right back to his little congregation and they fire away. They blast him and they judge him and they condemn him. And Peter caved. He folded like a bad poker hand. He got right back with his Jewish buddies, doing all the Jewish things, and turned his back on the Gentiles. So much so that the Apostle Paul, also a Jew, also a devout religious Hebrew, the Apostle Paul had to confront Peter to his face, and all this is in Galatians chapter 2. What happened was Peter was all excited initially about getting together with people that were unlike him. There was an energy there. It was a great adventure. It was a gospel-centered, good news adventure of of bringing God's grace to the world. He went back to his religious community. He got hammered for it, and he caved. He collapsed. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 says, I'm confronting Peter to his face. He hung around people who were labeled unclean, Gentiles for a while, got some pressure, and stopped. Paul says that's an embarrassment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what you have in Acts chapter 10 is you have this high point in Peter's life where, yeah, he's compelled by an angel and compelled by the Holy Spirit and compelled by the sword of a, of a soldier to go and meet with Cornelius, but he embraces that. God doesn't show favoritism, enjoys this wonderful relationship for days in Cornelius' house. Goes right back, gets some pressure at church and abandons the whole operation. And God says, okay, Peter, I'm moving from you to Paul and the rest of the book is about Paul. God pushed Peter aside and said, we're going where the action is. We're going where people are gonna embrace this vision of everyone across the earth, not only experiencing a relationship with God, but really embracing the vision of a relationship with each other. God says, that's where I'm putting my energy. And I'm telling you right now, right now, today, in our day, particularly this last year, this last 363 days or whatever it's been, I believe with all my heart that God is moving away from Peter and moving towards Paul. God is moving away from a large portion of his church that is dedicated to their little faithful remnant, that is dedicated to all of the barriers of politics and all the barriers of race and all the barriers of religion, anybody who is excited about creating their own camp of judgmental people based on politics, race, and religion, all of those people are Peters. They're cowards. They're living in this little bubble of sameness, doing exactly what Peter and his friends ended up doing judging people, building walls, labeling people, and God is moving from Peter's, and he is moving to Paul's. And so as a church, we have a decision to make. Are we going to be a Peter church or a Paul church? Are we going to judge? Are we going to condemn? Are we going to build walls? Are we going to try to seek this little faithful remnant and pat ourselves on the back at how holy we are and right we are and moral we are and fire away at everybody else? That's a Peter church. That is failing. Or are we going to be a Paul church? and say, we're going to take the more courageous route. Not just for one encounter with one person, but for the long haul. We're going to love everyone everywhere. We're going to build relationships we wouldn't normally build. I'm going to encourage you right now, if there's someone that you are an enemy with by individual 
terrible relationship, find a way to build a bridge. Send the text today, make a phone call. You know, we haven't talked in, each, uh, in a while, let's talk. Apologize in areas that need, need apologies, build some bridges. If there is a group of people, political, racial, ethnic, religious, that you are uncomfortable with, build a bridge. Build a bridge, get to know someone at work. Grab a lunch with someone. Post-pandemic, I really want to urge you to get an invite list, people that you're going to invite over to your home that you would never invite in your life. My wife and I have a list. So if you get an invitation, know that you're a strange one. And we want you in. <laughs> but we've got a little list of people we wouldn't normally hang around with, right? And we're going to start inviting those people over after, after this pandemic kind of settles down, hopefully sooner rather than later. Let's be Paul's for the long haul. To his death, and we'll see this in two weeks, the Apostle Paul went to everyone. He could possibly go to every city, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every ethnicity. He was so eager to break down these political walls, religious walls, and ethnic walls and get the grace of God to the world. Let's be a Paul church and not the cowardly Peter church. It'll be a great adventure, I promise you. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for these stories in the book of Acts. They are profoundly unsettling for many, which is why they're there. Every time a story emerges in Acts, the, the, the religious culture gets tense because it's new and it's different. It was a first that happened 2,000 years ago, but there are so many other firsts that need to take place in our own time, in our own churches, in our own lives. And God, we see here that two people so unlike were forced together. And they built a friendship and a camaraderie that lasted for a while. But God, we want to see this story continue in, in permanence. We want to see everyone, all of us who, who know Jesus, have been loved by Jesus, understand the grace of God through Jesus. We just simply want to love as he loves us. We want to love everyone everywhere, not fall into these lazy categories, not fall into lazy judgments, self-exaltation, self-congratulations, but God, to follow Jesus who broke down every barrier, treated everyone as equally the same, We want to embrace what Peter embraced just for a moment, that we are to label no one unclean, but to understand that your grace extends to all, freely given to all. And Jesus proved that by his life of love, by his death, and by his resurrection, that is the victory that love wins, that love is eternal, that love will not fail. So God, as Peter chose ultimately the more cowardly way, we want to choose the way of Paul, the courageous way as a religious man who chose to see the vision of a world not only united to you through Jesus, but a world united to each other in Christ. Help us to practice that in our own lives. Help us to practice that in a church that you might be honored through us. In Christ's name we pray and everybody said, amen.